Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Drino here. Today we're continuing the Evidence for Evolution series with the topic of vestigial structures, and I promise this is not just an excuse for me to say coccyx a bunch of times. So let's go! First, it is helpful to define what a vestigial structure is. Most definitions state that it's a structure that has no apparent function and appear to be residual parts from a past ancestor, but it is important to note here that we do not need to assume common descent for something to be vestigial. We can just compare the vestigial structure with a currently functioning version of the structure in a different species. For instance, the wings of flightless birds. We don't need to assume that flightless birds had a common ancestor with birds that can fly. We can see that the structure of the flightless wings is homologous to the structure of the functioning wings, but they can't fly, so it's vestigial. Cave-dwelling salamanders have eyes that start to develop into the early stages of the salamander's life, but then regress and get covered over with flaps of skin. Whales and snakes have pelvises, but no hind legs, and things like that. Also important is the fact that a structure does not have to be completely devoid of function in order to be considered vestigial, but the function that it currently has does have to be different from the function that it is a remnant of. After all, can you really call a wing a vestigial wing if the animal still uses it to fly? So even though there is evidence that cetaceans use their vestigial pelvises as anchor points for muscles that are important to mating, the fact that they no longer use their pelvises to connect to legs makes their pelvises vestigial, since that's the main function of pelvises in other animals that have them. So it is a definitive fact that vestigial structures do exist. Now why are they evidence for evolution? Isn't evolution about building new things rather than dismantling old things? Well, yes and no. Evolution is an undirected process. There is no end goal. A mutation doesn't happen with the goal of eventually building an eye. But if a skin cell mutates in a way that makes it sensitive to light, and this sensitivity helps the organism survive long enough to reproduce, then that mutation will survive. Actually, I should clarify, the mutation would have to be in the germline, not the skin cell itself. A germline mutation is a mutation that occurs within a germ cell, which are the cells that develop into sperm and eggs. The mutations that are heritable happen in the germ cells. So for this light-sensitive cell to contribute to evolution, there would be a mutation in the germ cells that cause some of the skin cells to have light sensitivity once they develop. Evolution can then take this light sensitivity to light and build on it through more germline mutations. But then what happens to this hypothetical eye when an organism's environment changes? So let's say a salamander somehow ends up living in an underground water system with no light. Well, in that scenario, having the ability to detect light will be pretty much useless, so there is no more evolutionary pressure to produce and enhance the salamander's already existing eyes. But there's also not necessarily pressure to completely eliminate it either. But with no pressure to either improve or eliminate a feature, the tendency is for features to atrophy over time. Without a selection pressure to improve on an existing feature, the random germline changes that will have an effect on the feature itself will tend to degrade it. In fact, there could even be a slight benefit to degrading a useless feature. It takes a lot of resources to build a fully functioning eye. Those resources could be put to use elsewhere in the body if they weren't so busy building eyes. So in this instance, there will be a slight, a very slight selection pressure toward the elimination of the eye, which then frees up these resources for other uses. In fact, it's not hard to imagine in these salamanders' case why there might have been a selection pressure in favor of a bit of skin covering their eyes. After all, eyes are tender and vulnerable. If you're not going to use them for seeing, then it's just a spot on your face where it's easy to get hurt. So with an evolutionary process, one would expect that, over long scales of time, you would see structures that used to perform a function in the past that no longer work for that function. And this is what we see. But more than that, because evolution can only work on structures that already exist, you would expect to see structures showing signs of changing what their primary function is. So, for instance, the pelvis in the whale. We now know that this serves as an anchor point for muscles that are important for mating, but how do we know it was really a pelvis and not just a similar looking structure? Because we're able to trace its embryological development and it shares the development path of other mammalian pelvises. So we have vestigial structures that become atrophied by a combination of random mutations and a lack of selection pressures. Does this mean that mutations can bring these structures back? Sometimes. When a vestigial structure mutates in a way that causes it to become more fully developed than it normally is, that's called an atavism. 
So, for instance, as an embryo, all humans had a tail. It started off fairly small, but gradually grew until its length peaked around Carnegie stage 16. Carnegie stage is just being a measurement of the development of the embryo. After Carnegie stage 16, the tail starts shrinking until finally turning into the fused vertebrae that are our coccyx. But sometimes, because of mutations, the tail continues to develop into an almost full external tail. Depending on the exact cause of the tail, some people can actually control it and move it. Now let's look at our eyes. In the corner of your eye, you have a small flap of skin that is all that remains of our ancestors' nictitating membrane. The nictitating membrane is the third eyelid that many animals use to protect their eyes and keep them moist, while being at least partially translucent so they can still see through it. It's present in birds, reptiles, and most mammals, but is very rare in apes. We can see the vestiges of the nictitating membrane in our plica semilunaris but we don't get a full third eyelid that we can sweep across our eyes. And it is again worth pointing out that this has been determined through embryological study. The plica semilunaris is the result of the embryonic version of the nictitating membrane, and as with so many vestigial features, it develops further in the embryo than it needs to, and then regresses and is reabsorbed in later stages of development. So as an embryo, we develop a nictitating membrane that covers the full eye, but then shrinks, or rather doesn't grow as the eye grows, until it's just a bit of skin in the corner of the eye. But sometimes, an incredibly rare mutation will cause the nictitating membrane to survive embryonic development and persist into childhood, such as in this case here with a nine-year-old girl. This was not a fully functioning nictitating membrane, and we wouldn't expect it to be. We would not have lost the nictitating membrane in one single large mutation, so why would we expect it to come back in one big leap? But this girl had a nictitating membrane that was attached to the plica semilunaris in exactly the way one would expect of a bona fide nictitating membrane. And in a standalone video on vestigial structures, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the appendix. It has been thought since Darwin's time that the appendix is a vestigial structure, a leftover from our herbivorous ancestors that aided in the digestion of plants. However, this has turned out to not be the case. This myth has persisted largely because an appendectomy is one of the most common surgical procedures in the developed world, and for most people, there are no long-term side effects of having your appendix out at all. But it has been suggested from as early as 1900 that the appendix has a function as part of the immune system. Important to note here that this hypothesis was made on the grounds of phylogenetic study, with phylogenetics being another line of evidence for evolution that I will cover in a later video. For now, let me just say that using evolution as an assumption, the prediction was made that the appendix serves a function as part of the immune system. It wasn't known what the function would be, and many a joke has been made over the years that the primary function of the appendix is to pad a surgeon's pockets, but in 2007, it was identified as being essentially a reservoir for a person's healthy gut bacteria to repopulate the intestines during recovery from an infection that is cleared out by a rapid flushing of fecal matter from the colon, known more commonly as diarrhea. It took so long to discover this function of the appendix for two reasons. Firstly, it wasn't until 2003 that it was discovered how important the colonies of symbiotic bacteria living in our digestive tracts are to our health and immune system, so the fact that the appendix served as a safe house for this bacteria wasn't something anyone would have even thought to look into, for the simple reason that they didn't know how important these bacteria are. And secondly, because the apparent lack of long-term health consequences from having the appendix removed supported the idea that it didn't perform any any sort of function. But this is where it gets kind of neat. We are actually living through a period of time where the appendix is likely to come out on the other end as a vestigial structure, because the reason you can live a perfectly healthy life without one is because of modern medicine and hygiene. Historically speaking, diarrheal diseases have always been one of the top causes of human death, so the existence of a feature that evolved to help protect us from these illnesses is expected, and of course it doesn't work perfectly. Its role is essentially to help with recovery. If the disease is caused by poor sanitation, and the sanitation doesn't change, the person won't get to a point where repopulating the gut bacteria will matter. But in the instances where they do successfully eliminate the disease, the appendix is very helpful for a safe recovery. So in developed countries with access to modern medicine and clean drinking water, I guess that means not Flint, Michigan, sorry guys, the appendix is essentially useless, making it an excellent example of an organ that, while not technically vestigial, is on the road to vestigiality. 
It is entirely conceivable that since modern medicine and hygiene have rendered the presence of an appendix unnecessary, and that while appendicitis is usually not deadly, it does still kill a few hundred people every year, that there is actually a slight selection pressure toward the elimination of the appendix. So it is possible that in a few hundred to a few thousand years, the appendix will be greatly diminished from what it is now, or will have developed some other function than the one it serves today. I could go on and on about all the different vestigial structures that are out there, from our ear muscles that actively try to turn our ears toward sound despite them being too weak to actually accomplish this task, even in people that can still wiggle their ears, to male nipples, to lizards who exist in an all-female population but still go through the motions of sex with each other before reproducing through parthenogenesis, which is the laying of an unfertilized egg that still develops, to dandelions still having sex organs necessary for sexual fertilization despite reproducing entirely through egg asexual means, to goosebumps, all of these are fascinating examples of vestigiality, and when tied in with homology and embryology, we can tell in most cases that these vestigial features are homologous with fully functioning counterparts in other species. This only makes sense in light of evolution, that as a species adapts to a changing environment, it ceases to need something that was helpful for their ancestors, and since there was a lack of selection pressures, mutations over time cause that feature to atrophy, or in some cases, develop a new use for which there is a selection pressure. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, don't forget to subscribe. There are new additions to this series every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern, and I do direct response videos to creationists usually every Friday at noon Eastern. Special thanks to my patrons who are the super lube that keeps this machine greased up. And if you want to be my lube, you can support the show at patreon.com slash vice rhino, or just follow the link in the description. Links to my social media pages can also be found in the description. See you next time. 